Good evening. Welcome, everybody. I'm Cindy Jordan, a member of the Board of Directors of the Walnut Creek Library Foundation. It's wonderful to see so many of you here this evening. I'd like to welcome you to Live from the Library for Shakespeare's 1623 and the First Folio. Uh, our host this evening is, or our speaker this evening is Mark Jordan. Mark is a historical scholar on a variety of topics, most notably Shakespeare, the Lewis and Clark Expedition, and the Shackleton Expedition. He has shared his presentations at the Walnut Creek Library, the Black Hawk Museum, the Lewis and Clark Trail Heritage Foundation, and Ollie classes at Cal State East Bay, UC Berkeley, Santa Clara University, and the University of South Carolina. I'd like to thank our program sponsors this evening, East Bay Times, Friends of the Walnut Creek Library, and Minuteman Press Lafayette. If you enjoy the program this evening, please consider making a donation to the Library Foundation to support our programs. You may do so at our website, www.wclibrary.org, or you may donate at the tip jar back at the refreshment counter. <laughs> Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. Please silence your cell phones. And also, around 7.45 and maybe 7.55, you'll hear announcements for the library closure. Don't be alarmed by that. You'll still be able to get out at the end of the program. <laughs> and uh, without further ado, please welcome me. Please join me in welcoming Mark Jordan. Uh, hello and welcome to 400 Years, Shakespeare 1623 and the issuance of the first folio. Now, here is a book that I absolutely love. <clears throat> it is one of the most important books ever printed. It appeared in 1623, 400 years ago, and has had an impact far in excess of rather its hefty bulk. <clears throat> now, it is commonly referred to as the first folio, <clears throat> and while in 17th century publishing, folio was a style of book printing, when you hear the words first folio, it only applies to this rather marvelous book. <clears throat> also, tonight, all of the women we might have lost, I skipped that, but knowing I love my books, he furnished me from my own library with volumes that I prize above my dukedom. So says Prospero, loving his library, as we love our library. Now, folio, the first folio, what is it? What are quartos? That is the question. So first, a few words about publishing in the 17th century. You will hear books referred to as folios, quartos, even octavos. So a folio is a sheet of paper. You always need a stagehand. A sheet of paper, usually a little bit larger like than this, given a single fold like this, and you have four printed pages. You can see a oh, relative size. The pages for a folio would be a little bit bigger than this. If you take the same sheet of paper and fold it a second time, you have what is known as a quarto. And you have eight printed pages. Of course, you have to make a cut on the top. Here you can see a roughly sized quarto. This is a facsimile of a Shakespearean quarto. You get a rough idea of the relative size. If then, you also take the same sheet of paper and give it another fold. You have what is known as an octavo, and you get 16 printed pages. And books were printed in all three sizes. So forgetting books for a second, what is it that we love about Shakespeare? I submit that it's the magic. Ye yells of hills, brooks, standing lakes and groves, and you who by whose aid I have been dim the noontide sun, call forth the mutinous winds, and twixt the green sea and the azure vault, set roaring war. To the dread rattling thunder have I given fire, the strong base promontory have I made shake, and by the spurs plucked up the pine and cedar. Graves at my command have waked their sleepers, oped, and let them forth by my so potent art. So potent art, 
Doesn't that tell us everything we need to know about Shakespeare? So let me now talk a little bit about the world of Shakespearean quartos. From the period of the early 1590s to 1623, Shakespeare is one of the most, or the most, published author. He has over 80 editions of his work appear in quarto. Now, one quarter of those works are his poetry. You can see on the screen Venus and Adonis, the Rape of Lucretia, and his sonnets. Here is a facsimile edition of Venus and Adonis, quarto size, like this. And so this is how it would have appeared. So that's one quarter of his, over one quarter of his books. The remaining three quarters of his books were his plays. That's approximately 60 editions of his plays. Now, unbound copies of his plays would be used and read until they were worn out. And then they could be repurposed as wrapping paper or from, for other more unsavory uses. Uh, <clears throat> but if they wanted to, they could take a volume and, like this, have it bound, or take multiple copies of the plays and have them bound, and so they would be preserved. But generally, since they're so ephemeral, they are generally rare today. So 18 of Shakespeare's plays had appeared in quarto. OK, now, here are the more popular ones. You can see Richard III, very popular. Richard II, very popular. Henry IV, part one, with Falstaff, the most popular of the plays. Next slide. Hamlet. Also reasonably popular, as you can see here. And then the last slide shows us uh, those plays issued in quarto, which didn't have quite the level of popularity. So once again, this is a quarto, and this is a folio. <laughs> now again, a, now just a, a folio is just merely a way of describing how a book was set up for printing in the 17th century, but it's an also an indication of its size and its relative importance because it was a format used for really important books, religious works, philosophical works, scientific works, not for plays. So the first folio, which is a proper noun, no less, that's a distinction with a difference, for in this folio appear 36 of the dramatic works of William Shakespeare. The first folio can apply only to this wonderful book. So, Hemings, Condal, Burbage, who are they and why are they important? Well, Shakespeare was one of the original shareholders, owners, of a theatrical group who in Elizabethan times was called the Lord Chamberlain's Men. When James became king, they became known as the King's Men. They also owned the theaters in which they performed. By 1620, Shakespeare and most of the other original shareholders had died. But there are two remaining shareholders who are key to the story we're going to tell tonight. Let's introduce them now. They're John Hemming, or Hemmings as it's sometimes spelled, and Henry Condell. Hemmings was Shakespeare's partner in the original formation of the company. He was the financial manager of the company, and whenever the troop got into trouble or there was questions about what they were doing, he was the spokesperson for it. Henry Condell came in a little bit later. He's an actor, like Hemming was, uh, and a partner, part owner of the company. He was a, also a manager of the company's affairs. These men would have been the possessors of the manuscripts and prompt books that are owned by the company. <clears throat> now, Shakespeare, Hemmings, and Condell were extremely close. Shakespeare, in his will, leaves to Hemmings, Condell, and Burbage, who we'll see in a second, a reasonable, sizable sum of money so they can buy commemorative or mourning rings to remember him by. A very close bond. They had been very tight for over 20 years. Now, Shakespeare died in 1616. In 1619, an even more significant death occurs, that of, let me get over here so you can see him, Richard Burbage. Burbage is a, one of the original owners of the theater company. Burbage is the best known, the most popular actor in Elizabethan and Jacobean England. He is so popular that when he dies, his mourning is greater than that was expressed for Queen Anne, who was James's queen at the time. And here you have a couple of poems that were written about him at the time. First one, he's gone and with him, what a world are dead, which he reviewed to be revived so. No more young Hamlet, old Oronimo, 
kind Lear, the grieved more and more beside that lived in him have now forever died. And then this one, hung be the heavens with black, yield day to night. Comets importing chain, shoot through the sky, scourge the foul fates that thus afflict our sight. Burbage the player has vouchsafed to die, therefore in London is not one eye dry. The deaths of men who act our queens and kings are now more mourned than are the real things. <laughs> Burbage's death, as well as Shakespeare's, profoundly affected Hemming and Condell. Now the first folio might never have appeared if this fellow, Ben Johnson, Shakespeare's competitor, Shakespeare's friend, who worked with the company, wrote many plays, he produced a folio of his works, you see the title page here, at the time. Now his folio included more than the, the, a few of the plays that he included in there, so it included all the works that he had done. Hemings and Condell must have seen this, and it was an impelling factor in getting them to go ahead and do what they wanted to do. They embarked on a mission to memorialize both the player and the plays as a testament to each his greatness, as a tribute, and it was a labor of love because there was no way that they would garner any economic benefit in them trying to publish a version of all the plays in the 36 plays in the folio. So what do they do? Take the uh, manuscripts to the printer. <clears throat> in the early 1620s, Hemings and Condell brought the plays to a group of publish and print, publishers and printers. Now given the size of the work, it required more than a single printer, so a consortium or a syndicate was put together of basically rival publishers who got together specifically for this project. And they are William Jaggard, he's the owner of the printing company. By the time Hemings and Condell show up at his door, he's blind. He ultimately dies just before the folio was issued. He had previous dealings with Shakespeare's plays and poems. His son Isaac runs the uh, printing shop and all, with his father, and then when his father dies, he runs a printing shop, and he's ultimately responsible for issuing the folio. Edward Blunt is another important publisher. Uh, he had published works by Christopher Marlowe, Ben Jonson, even Cervantes, and he owned the rights to Anthony and Cleopatra. It was important to bring in people who owned the rights to the plays. John Smithick, less important than the other three, but he had the rights to Love's Labor's Lost, to Romeo and Juliet and Hamlet, and William Aspley had the rights to Much Ado Out Nothing and Henry IV, Part II. Now, the Jaggards assembled the work that was brought to them by Hemings and Condell. But when necessary, they would have to go to other printer publishers and get the rights to publish some of the plays that were out there that weren't in their control. But ultimately, 36 of the plays are gathered together into what we now know as the first folio. Some of the material given to the printers was Shakespeare's handwritten drafts. Some of the work material given to him was the prompt books of the globe. And then the question comes up, what about the quartos that have been printed? Did they contribute? And the answer is yes. If the quarto, if the printers believed, if Hemmings and Condell believed that the printer represented Shakespeare's draft of the play, then they could use the quarto versions of the plays, although they could be updated. There were also bad quartos. Uh, a bad quarto was a corrupt version of the play, and there you can see a list of some of the corrupt versions. They couldn't be used in setting type of the first folio. Now, the most blatant example of a difference between a bad quarto and what's in the first folio can be seen in a play called Hamlet. I'm assuming at least a couple of you have heard of the play Hamlet. <laughs> and maybe a couple of you, or maybe a few less, have heard of the speech to be or not to be, probably the most famous piece of theatrical literature ever written. Well, the text in the folio runs something like this. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles on by opposing and them. To die, to sleep no more, and by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. It is a consummation devoutly to be wished, to die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream, aye, there's the rub, for in that sleep of death 
What dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the poor man's contumely, the pangs of disprised love, the laws delay the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes, when he himself might his quietus make with a bare bodkin. Who would these fardels bear, to grunt and sweat under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveller returns, puzzles the will, and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus conscience does make cowards of us all, and thus the native hue of resolution is sicklied o'er with the pale cast of thought and enterprises of great pith and moment with this regard their currents turn away and lose the name of action. That's a magnificent speech. The patology is incredible. The structure of the speech is incredible. The philosophy behind the speech is incredible, which is why it's the most analyzed, most discussed speech in the history of English theater. In 1603, a quarto of Hamlet is printed. And in that quarto, the speech goes something like this. To be or not to be, I, there's the point. To die, to sleep, is that all? I, all. No, to sleep, to dream, I, marry, there it goes. For in that dream of death, when we awake, and born before an everlasting judge, from whence no passenger ever returned, the undiscovered country, at whose sight the happy smile and the accursed damned. But for this, the joyful hope of this, who'd bear the scorns and flattery of the world? Scorned by the right rich, the rich cursed of the poor, the widow being oppressed, the orphan wronged, uh, the taste of hunger and a tyrant's reign, and thousand more calamities besides. To grunt and sweat under this weary life, but that the dread of something, uh, but, but for that he made his own quietus make with the bare bodkin. Who would this endure but for the hope of something after death, which puzzles the brain and doth confound the sense, and makes us ra which makes us rather bear those evils we have than fly to others that we know not of. I that, oh, this conscience makes cowards of us all. So I'm assuming, hopefully, some of you noticed a difference between the two. Uh, the grammatical construction of it is pretty bad to say the best that can be said about it. The poetry, although it hits a few spots occasionally, is pretty banal. And the philosophy, well, all I have to say is, if this was the version that had been handed down, it would never be remembered. So, a number of quartos were used to print the text. You can see those. Much Ado About Nothing, Love's Labor's Lost, The Merchant of Venice, A Midsummer Night's Dream, and Henry IV, Part I. They were deemed to be reasonably perfect copies of the plays. The next slide shows those plays that, while the quarto version could be used to set, that's so they can read them. We'll talk see them shortly. So, Troilus and Cressida, Henry IV, Part II. Titus Andronicus, the best play ever written. Um, Richard II, Richard III, King Lear, Othello, Hamlet, and Romeo and Juliet, maybe, because they also appeared in bad quartos. And then, of course, there were the bad quartos. Although they had uh, appeared in print, they couldn't be used to set the plays. Now, there is a more important reason, however, than the appearance or the correction of quarto versions of the plays. It's valuable because, and it should be obvious from hints that I've already given you, 18 plays in the Shakespearean canon appeared in quarto. Now, here is the table of contents of the first folio. There are 36 plays there. Forget about the number 35 for a minute. We'll talk about that later. That means 18, 18 plays had never seen the light of print from the time they were written in stage till the appearance of the first folio. 18. What does that mean? You might ask. If these plays that appeared for the first time in the first folio had not gotten to the printers, if Heming and Condell, Shakespeare's best theater buddies, hadn't carted those 18 plays down to the printers, 
what might we have lost? Okay, well, let's take an example. The play As You Like It did not appear until the first folio. Without As You Like It, we would never have heard all the world's a stage and all the men and women, merely players. They have their exits and their entrances and one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. At first the infant mewling and puking in the nurse's arms. Then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shiny morning face creeping like snail unwillingly to school. And then the lover, oh, sighing like furnace with a woeful ballad made to his mistress, eyebrow. And then the soldier full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard, jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth. And then the justice in the fair round belly with good capon lined, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances, and so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts to the lean and slippered pantaloon with spectacles on nose and pouch on side his youthful hose, well saved, the world too wide for his shrunk shank, and his big manly voice turning again towards childish trouble, pipes and whistles in his sound. Last scene of all that ends this strange eventful history, his second childishness and mere oblivion, son teeth, son eyes, son taste, sons, everything. Okay, so, can you imagine, that's okay. <laughs> can you really imagine a world without this speech and a number of the other speeches that we'll be hearing tonight? Another thing, as you like it, has this magnificently engaging female character named Rosalind. She's engaging, she's sparking, she's witty. She's one of many women who appear only in the first folio. Shakespeare's women, nothing distinguishes Shakespeare more from his contemporaries and most subsequent playwrights than the women he so memorably and deftly creates. Okay, printing the first folio. The material is taken to a print shop, which is a place for setting the type, imprinting the paper, and of course, putting the book together. Here you can see, oops, let me grab this guy, a printing press roughly from the period. Here you can see what a print shop generally looked like at the time. We'll look at that a little bit more later on. Okay, so of the plays of pride in manuscript, some of them were definitely in Shakespeare's own really superlative handwriting, <laughs> as you can see there. Get out of the way. Uh, it was very obviously very, very difficult for somebody to read this. They went out and hired a professional scribe by the name of Ralph Crane to prepare fresh transcripts of the plays. So Crane had been employed by the King's Men and was producing clean copies of what whoever wrote the plays so they could be read. Crane is hired to produce clean copy, whoops, too soon, sin, to write clean copy for the Murray Wives of Windsor, The Tempest, The Two Gentlemen of Verona, Measure for Measure, and The Winner's Tale. You can see here it doesn't show terribly clearly, but Crane's handwriting is obviously much neater than Shakespeare's was. Okay. The plays are arranged into the comedies, histories, and tragedies published according to the true original copies. Hemings and Condell emphasized that the plays appearing in the first folio were replacing the earlier stolen and surreptitious copies maimed and deformed by frauds and stealths of injurious impostors. Asserting that Shakespeare's true words are now offered for your view cured and perfect of their limbs and all the rest absolute in their numbers as he conceived them. It was their intent to ensure that the plays as handed down for succeeding generations would be as accurate as Shakespeare intended them to be. Now, Shea, Hemings and Condell grouped the 36 plays into three categories, the comedies, the histories, and the tragedies. Okay, there we are. Comedies, histories, tragedies. Uh, we'll look at the history plays first. The history plays that appeared in Porto was we have seen Richard III, Richard II, Henry IV, part one, were extremely popular. In the folio, only three new histories are added. They are King John, Henry VI, part one, and Henry VIII. And although they're not particularly popular, they do have some fascinating characters in them, uh, two of them. Women 
Now, Henry VI Part I is one of Shakespeare's earliest plays. It involves the wars between the French and the English in the 15th century, and the French are led by Joan of Arc until she's ultimately captured and executed by the English. But the young Joan has a vision, and she approaches the Dauphin. Dauphin, I am by birth a shepherd's daughter, my wit untrained in any kind of art. Heaven and Our Lady Gracious hath it pleased to shine on my contemptible estate. God's mother, in a vision full of majesty, willed me to leave my base vocation and free my country from calamity. Her age she promised and assured success in complete glory. She revealed herself. Ask me what question thou canst possible, and thou shalt find that I shall answer unpremeditated. My courage try by combat, if thou darest, and thou shalt find that I exceed my sex. Resolve on this, thou shalt be fortunate, if thou receive me for thy warlike mate. Assigned am I to be the English scourge this night, the siege assuredly I'll raise. So here we have an early example of how Shakespeare develops his fascinating women characters. Now, one of, Henry's, uh, one of Shakespeare's last play is Henry VIII, in which there is another fascinating female character named Catherine of Aragon. Now, I'm assuming, again, some of you have heard of Henry VIII, and some of you might be familiar with the fact that he had six wives. He's trying to divorce Catherine of Aragon so he can marry Anne Boleyn. In order to do so, he holds a hearing or a trial or a tribunal to try and determine the legality of the first marriage. <clears throat> Queen Catherine appears before the tribunal and offers this. Sir, I desire you do me right and justice, and to bestow your pity on me, for I am a most poor woman and a stranger born out of your dominions. Alas, sir, in what have I offended you? What cause has my behavior given to your displeasure, that thus you should proceed to put me off and take your good grace from me? Heaven witness, I have been to you a true and humble wife at all times to your will, conformable. When was the hour I ever contradicted your desire or made it not mine, too? Of which are your friends have I not strove to love, although I knew he were mine enemy? What friend of mine had to him derived your anger? Did I continue in my liking? Nay, gave notice he was from thence discharged. Sir, call to mind, I have been your wife in this obedience upwards of twenty years and have been blessed with many children by you. If in the course and process of this time you can report and prove it too against mine honor ought, my bond to wedlock, or my love and duty against your sacred person, in God's name, turn me away into the foulest contempt, shut door upon me, and so give me up to the sharpest kind of justice. Please you, sir. The king, your father, was reputed for a prince, most prudent, Ferdinand. My father was reckoned one, the wisest prince. It is not to be questioned that they had gathered a wise counsel to them who deemed our marriage lawful. Wherefore, I humbly beseech, uh, beseech you, sir, to pardon me till I, may be, be, till I may be by my friends in Spain advised, whose counsel I will implore. If not, in the name of God, your pleasure be fulfilled. Now, what's interesting about that speech is it's nearly identical to the actual words Catherine spoke at the tribunal 80 years before. It's just take Shakespeare taking those words and turning them into a poetic speech. Also, incidentally, in 1613, during a performance of Henry VIII, they discharge a cannon. A spark catches on, on the roof of the Globe Theater, and it burns to the ground. And one can only imagine Hemming and Condell and all the rest of the men running into the library and grabbing all the plays in the library. <clears throat> then there's King John, which has several interesting women in the play. There's Eleanor of Aquitaine, the best known. And then there's Constance. If you're familiar with, for example, A Lion in Winter or History, you may know that Henry II had multiple sons, one of whom is Geoffrey. He marries Constance. They have a son named Arthur. Geoffrey dies and is arguably heir to the throne. John doesn't like that and spends a good part of the play trying to get rid of Arthur, which he ultimately does. And then Constance has this incredibly intensive lament. Grief fills the room up of my absent child, lies in his bed, walks up and down with me, puts on his pretty looks, repeats his words, 
remembers me of all his gracious parts, stuffs out his vacant garments with his form. The play also has this fascinating ahistorical character. His name is Philip Falconbridge. In the play, he's known as the Bastard. Apparently, his mother, who only makes a brief appearance in the play, was seduced by Richard the Lionheart and gave birth to this particular character. When he learns his mother was impregnated by Richard and he was the result, he is ecstatic. And he goes into a wild speech. Now, by the slight were I to get again, Madam, I would not wish a better father. Some sins do bear their privilege on earth, and so doth yours. Your fault was not your folly. These must you lay your heart at his disposed, subjected tribute to commanding love against whose fury and unmatched force the oldest lion could not wage the fight, nor keep his princely heart from Richard's hand. He that perforce robs lions of their hearts may easily win a woman's. Hi, my mother, with all my heart, I thank thee for my father, who lives and dares but say, Thou didst not well when I was got. I'll send his soul to hell. Now, what's interesting about that speech is he seems to have no qualms whatsoever that his mother was probably raped by Richard, if not at least forced to have sex with her, or the fact that he was disinherited. Now, another interesting Sideline fact is that Hemings and Condell died within four years of the issuance of the first folio. So just imagine what our loss would have been had they delayed any further. What is love tis not hereafter. Present mirth hath pleasant laughter. What's to come is still unsure. In delay there lies no plenty. And that's from Twelfth Night, another one of the plays that's only in the first folio. Now, in the first folio, there were 36 plays. But if you took the time to count what's here, there are only 35 listed. They had to tr get the rights to Troilus and Cressida, and they only got the rights to print Troilus and Cressida very late in the process, well after this, these pages, this page and all its copies had been printed. And so Troilus and Cressida doesn't appear in the table of contents. It does appear after Henry VIII and before the tragedy of Coriolanus and because it was so late. It's unpaginated. When everything was ready, the printers assembled the manuscripts and give it over to the men who were responsible for setting up the printing press. Now, here you can see uh, a, a little bit what a printing press looks like. We'll see a better picture of the types that are over here. Now, the compositors would dip into the type trays and use the type to set the, set the press. Now, here you see, let me get over here again. Uh, here you see a tray with all the letters in it, the paraphernalia involved there. Now, in these parts of the tray are the capital letters. In these parts of the tray are the smaller letters. These were the uppercase. These were the lowercase. Hence the name uppercase and lowercase for modern printing letters now. Now, at least five compositors worked on the first folio. Uh, they're identified as A, B, C, D, and E. Each had distinguishing characteristics so that people who edit the plays now can determine who they were. Compositor B apparently set as much as 50% of the play. The only person whose name we know is Compositor E. He was an apprentice. His work shows far more mistakes than all the others, and his name was John Leeson. Now, then there's the comedies. Well, the history plays, for now, for all intents and purposes, have been relegated to the realm of relative obscurity, though I saw two of them last year. The comedies are perennial favorites. None has ever achieved the popularity of a Midsummer Night's Dream. And just as an aside, Midsummer Night's Dream and Romeo and Juliet are by far the two most performed Shakespearean plays and probably the two most performed plays in the history of theater. But many of these comedies do appear in summer Shakespeare festivals. On the list, for example, is All's Well That Ends Well. It's my least favorite play. It's referred to as a problem play. And one of the reasons it's a problem, it's not very funny. So much for comedies. There is an interesting female character in there named Helena. And she has good skills and an interesting personality. But her insistence on marrying probably the most worthless male character in all of Shakespeare makes degrades her as a character. But what other comedies had not appeared in Quarto? 
and what debt of gratitude do we owe to Hemming and Condell? Well, we've heard, as you like it. And as you like it, we meet Rosalind. Shakespeare is really delightful and articulate Rosalind. We're dressed as a boy, played by a boy, dressed as a girl, dressed as a boy. She is pursued by the lovesick Phoebe, a boy dressed as a girl, who is pursued by the lovesick Silvius, who is a boy dressed as a boy. Okay. To put Phoebe off, Rosalind hurls layers of scornful insults at them. You foolish shepherd, wherefore do you follow me like foggy south, puffing like wind and rain? You are a thousand times a proper man than she, a woman, to such fools as you that fills the world full of ill-favored children. Tis not her class, but you that flatters her, and out of you she sees herself more proper than any of her lineaments can show her. But mistress, know yourself down on your knees and thank heaven, fasting for a good man's love, for I must tell you, friendly in your ear, sell when you can. You are not for all markets. <laughs> That's one of my favorite lines in all of Shakespeare. <clears throat> Cry the man mercy, love him, take his offer. So take her to thee, shepherd. Fare you well, and she tries to flee and escape. <clears throat> now here you see the acting company. Uh, you see at the top, William Shakespeare. He indeed was an actor in the company. You see Hemming, you see Condell, and then of course Richard Burbage. Richard Burbage, as I mentioned, was the most important actor in this period of time. He plays Hamlet, he plays King Lear, he plays Othello, he plays Richard III, he plays Henry V. He's also reputed to have played Romeo. He's a little old for Romeo, I think, but, you know, that's theater. On my right, you see Will Kemp. He was the company's clown for the first years that they were together. Uh, he plays Falstaff, he plays Dogberry, he plays Bottom, and the other comic characters up to roughly 1599 when he leaves the theater. Then on the right is Robert Armin replaces Kemp. He plays a much more sophisticated clown, Festy in Twelfth Night, the fool in King Lear, Touchstone, <coughs> in As You Like It. Traditions assign certain roles to Shakespeare, but there's no definitive proof that Shakespeare played any of them. Then there's the Comedy of Errors. Comedy of Errors is Shakespeare as slapstick. There are two pairs of twins, master and servant, master and servant. They've been separated at birth. For whatever reason, that's theater for you, <laughs> one set of the twins comes into the town where the other set of twins lives. And the rest of the play is all about mistaken identity. Well, on one day, the out-of-town twins are dragged to the house of the in-town twins, who believe them to be the in-town twins. And while they're in there, the cook in the kitchen is chasing around the servant, thinking that that's her boyfriend. And he doesn't know what to make of it. Finally, he runs out of the house and he says, Mary, sir, she's the kitchen wench and all grease. And I know not what used to put her to, but to make a lamp of her and run from her by her own light. I warrant her rags and the tallow in them will burn a Poland winter. If she lives till doomsday, she'll burn a week longer than the whole world. Ah! <laughs> Another early play is Two Gentlemen of Verona. Two interesting women in that play, Julia and Sylvia, far more worthy than the men who were in that play. That happens a lot in Shakespeare. <clears throat> and there's a memorable song, Who is Sylvia, what is she, that all the swains commend her? That's a nod to my mother-in-law. There's Twelfth Night with some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. There are two memorable women in that play, Viola and Olivia, and the wonderful Malvolio, a part that I once proudly played. <clears throat> then there's Measure for Measure, where the Duke of Vienna, a part that I also played, turns over the governing of Vienna to the puritanical Angelo, who promises to clean up the mess that the Duke has left behind. And his first act is to condemn to death a young man who has gotten his girlfriend pregnant. The sister of the young man comes to beg of Angelo for wife. Her name is Isabella. He says, your brother dies tomorrow. And she says, so you must be the first to give this sentence. And he that suffers it 
Oh, it is excellent to have a giant's strength, but it is tyrannous to use it like a giant. Could great men thunder as Jove himself does? Jove would ne'er be quiet, for every pelting petty officer would use his heaven for thunder. Nothing but thunder. Merciful heaven, thou with thy sulfurous, that sharp and sulfurous bolt, splits the unwedgeable and gnarled oak than the surf soft myrtle. But man, proud man, dressed in a little brief authority, most ignorant of his, what he's most assured, his glassy essence, like an angry ape, plays such fantastic tricks before high heaven as makes the angels weep, who with our spleens would all themselves laugh mortal. Go to your bosom, knock there, and ask your heart what it doth know that's like my brother's fault, if it confess a natural guiltiness such as is his, let it not sound a thought upon your tongue against my brother's life. Well, while he's listening to this, the puritanical Angelo is getting more and more excited. What does he do? He says, if you have sex with me, I'll free your brother. Well, there comes a point in time when he thinks he's had sex with Isabella, and he fails to free her brother. Now, Ansel gets his comeuppance through trickery. It all resolves well. Okay, then there's the winter's tale. The winter's tale is about redemption and the healing magic of daughters and granddaughters. <laughs> okay, there are several important ladies in the play. There's Hermione, who is the wife of the king. There is her really good buddy, the very outspoken Paulina, and the teenage Perdita. Leontes has accused his wife Hermione of infidelity with his best friend and that the baby that she has just delivered as a bastard. But Paulina confronts him. It is yours. And might we lay the old proverb to the charge, so like you, tis the worse. Behold, my lords, the whole matter, although the print be little, the whole matter and copy of the father, eye, nose, lip, the trick of his frown, his forehead, <clears throat> nay, the valleys, the pretty dimples of his chin and cheek, his smiles, the very mold and frame of hand, nail finger, and now good goddess nature that has made it so like to him that got it. If thou hast the ordering of the mind too, let her suspect as he does her children, not her fathers, her husbands. Leontes, the husband, gets really annoyed. He turns to Paulina's husband and says, Thou art worthy to be hanged, that wilt not stay our tongue. And her husband Antigonus says, Hang all the husbands that cannot do that feat, you'll leave yourself hardly one subject. <laughs> Leontes then cries, Have her burnt. And she replies, I care not, it is an heretic who makes the fire, not she which burns in it. <clears throat> I'll not call you tyrant, but this most cruel usage of your queen, not able to produce more accusation than this, your own weak hinged fancy, something savors of tyranny and will ignoble make you, yea, scandalous to the world. Paulina's well, brave enough to risk her life. Can you imagine saying this to Henry VIII, for example? <laughs> well, Antigonus is destroyed with the uh, charged with the responsibility of destroying the baby girl. Well, he takes the baby, he runs off to Bohemia, and he leaves it in the middle of the field, where ultimately the baby's picked up and grows up to be Perdita. But at this point in time, we see probably the best stage direction that has ever been written, exit, pursued by a bear. <laughs> that was for you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Shakespeare had two daughters, uh, having lost his son, ten or so years before the play was written. Uh, daughters played key roles in many of the plays. Juliet, Ophelia, Goneril, Regan, Cordelia, Desdemona, Perdita, Miranda. <clears throat> now there's another comedy with two wildly different daughters that has achieved an enduring status, The Taming of the Shrew, with two interesting, what, the seemingly sweet Bianca, and the violently aggressive Katerina. Now Petruchio comes to town seeking to wive it wealthily in Padua. 
Kate the Shrew is his mean to gain that wealth. He couldn't care what she's like. So Petruchio the Worst steals himself their first encounter. I will attend her here and woo her with some spirit when she comes. Say that she rail. Why then I'll tell her plain she sings as sweetly as a nightingale. So I'll say that she frown. I'll say she looks as clear as morning roses, newly washed with dew. Say she be mute and will not speak a word. Then I'll commend her volubility and say she uttereth piercing eloquence. Aha, uh -huh. okay. <laughs> if she do bid me pack, I'll give her thanks, as though she bid me stay by her a week. If she deny to wed, I'll crave the day when I shall ask the bands and when be married off. Oh, here she comes. And now, Petruchio, speak. And what follows is probably well, first, one of their many classic battles, but is probably one of the funniest scenes in Shakespeare and is incredibly obscene, and for that reason makes it even funnier. Uh, there are many more of these. If you want, go online, YouTube it, look at Burton and Taylor doing this scene, or more interestingly, you can see Keith Michel and, of all people, Julie Andrews playing Katerina. It's a real treat to see. Katerina is a marvelous role and a great, great role for, a, for an actress. Okay. Printing houses would prepare the books using the modern printing press. Where's my little toy here? Okay, uh, give you a rough idea. Okay, so what you see here, this, well, what you see here is the type that has been set up. Now keep in mind when the typesetters are typing, setting up the type, they're doing it backwards. Okay, so that's, <laughs> that's one. He, this guy with the boxing gloves, what looks like boxing gloves, you, Jam it on the ink, you then pound out the ink onto the, the type. The man here sets the paper into the press, the press is pulled down, shoved in there, the handle of the press is turned, and the page is printed and comes out like that. So, pages were not printed in order. There wasn't enough type to print the pages in that manner. So what happens is, the first thing they do is print pages six and seven facing pages. They print all pages six and seven. They then reset the type to print pages five and eight. They take that sheet of paper, turn it over, and then print pages five and eight. They then set the type up for pages four and nine. They set the type for those, they print those, new sheet of paper obviously. They then set the type for pages three and 10, put in the same sheet of paper, other side, and print those pages out. <laughs> yeah. uh, obviously not a printer. And then they print pages, they set up the type for pages two and 11. They then print pages two and 11. Then set the type for pages one and 12, turn the sheets over and print pages one and 12. They then take, in this case of the folio, three sheets, into what they called a choir, that's Q-U-I-R-E, and this would be stitched together. Ultimately, the entire book is set up like this, these 12-page units, and then the book is then stitched together. You get, a, again, a rough idea of what the size of the pages are. Now here, you see the image of Shakespeare, the well-known image of Shakespeare, uh, Ben Johnson, his buddy, probably his competitor, probably maybe a little jealous, wrote to grace the picture, this figure that thou here seest put, it was for gentle Shakespeare cut, wherein the graver had a strife with nature to outdo the life. Oh, could he but have drawn his wit as well in brass as he hath hid his face, the print would then surpass all that was ever written brass. But since he cannot, reader, look, not on his picture, but his book. He also wrote a much longer poem, of which I'm giving you these couple of excerpts. Uh, now, Johnson was generally very sparing in his praise of Shakespeare. He was once told that Shakespeare barely blotted out a line, and Johnson's response was, would he had blotted out a thousand. <laughs> I confess thy writings to be such, as neither man nor muse can praise too much. Soul of an age, he was not of an age, but for all time, Shine forth, thou star of poets. 
So here we have Johnson foretelling of Shakespeare's long-term impact. His works will last for all time and will be for all people everywhere. Each folio required over 230 sheets. It came in at over 900 pages. And the book's preparation, the resources, the labor, the paper, it took up almost two years in the Jagged printing shop to produce. So, issuing the first folio and the cost to purchase. In November 1623, the first folio was available for sale. If you take into the assumed, uh, take into account paper, ink, and labor, the cost to produce any single folio was probably six shillings and eight pence. The final version of the book, if it was unbound, was probably 15 shillings. If it was bound in plain calfskin, it was a pound or 20 shillings. Not in a binding like that. That would have been a very fancy binding. That would have been much more expensive. And the best estimate is that there were 750 folios issued by the Jagged Press. And then we come to the tragedies. Familiarly, we see Romeo and Juliet. Oops. Ah, OK. Too soon, but that's OK. Uh, familiarly, we see Ro Oh, no. There we go. Oh, I'm sorry. I was looking the wrong side. We've been working on this a long time. OK. You see uh, Romeo. You see Hamlet. You see King Lear. You see Othello. You see a work that's not terribly well known, Timon of Athens, for good reason. And in there, you also see Cymbeline, King of Britain. It's treated as a tragedy for some reason by Hemings and Condell, but it's been relegated to the category of romance, sort of like The Winter's Tale uh, has been. And it does have an interesting female character named Imogen. Now, if you've never seen Cymbeline, or if you have seen Cymbeline and you'd love to see it again, this weekend and next weekend at Cal Shakes, they are putting on a free version of Cymbeline. All you have to do is go online, register, and then show up and you can see the play. I'm going to be there. I'd love to see all of you there. OK, Coriolanus. Coriolanus is the first play listed in the folio. It's a Roman play. It's about a great warrior by the name of Caius Martius. After a great victory at Corioli, they gave him the honorific Coriolanus. He's a man who is smothered by his mother, so much so that he cannot achieve self-understanding, and he cannot control his temper. His wife, Virgilia, is the sweet, quiet, unassuming person. But his mother, Volumnia, is a commanding presence, and she's messed up his life royally. Ultimately, she loses control of her son, who turns traitor to his own country uh, after it rejects him in one of the offices of, of town. She confronts him in front of the enemy army, which he's leading against Rome. For myself, son, I purpose not to wait on fortune till these wars determine. If I cannot persuade thee rather to show a noble grace to both parts than to seek the end of one, thou shalt no sooner march to assault thy country than to tread, trust to it, thou shalt not, on thy mother's womb that brought thee to this world. She is willing to either commit suicide or die in battle against her son. So Coriolanus, the mama's boy, relents. He then turns to his newfound allies and tries to convince them not to attack Rome. Well, they've seen this interaction, and he's challenged by his new allies, who challenge his manhood by calling him boy. And that sets him off. Measureless liar, thou hast made my heart too great for what contains it. Boy, oh slave, pardon me, lords, tis the first time that ever I was forced to scold. And that's Coriolanus is not really understanding himself because he's doing that throughout the whole play. <laughs> Your judgment, my grave lords, must give this cur the lie whose own notion, who wears my stripes impressed upon him, that must bear my beating to his grave, shall join to thrust the lie unto him. Cut me to pieces, Volsies. Men and lads, stain all your edges on me. Boy, false hound, if you have richer annals true, Tis there that, like an eagle in a dove colt, I fluttered your Volsians and Corioli. Alone I did it. Boy, 
Can you imagine bragging in front of the people you beat up pretty badly that, like that? But that's Coriolanus. Anyway, shortly after that, the rash, impetuous Coriolanus is run through by all the men he has just betrayed. Then there is that great staple of high school English, Julius Caesar. OK, Julius Caesar shows the seminal act of the ancient world, the assassination of Julius Caesar. And it contains one of those speeches that defines Shakespeare. We hear it from the lips of Mark Antony. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is often terrid with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it were a grievous fault. And grievously has Caesar answered it. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man, so are they all, all honorable men, come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me, but Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor hath cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet, Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. You did all see that on the looper cow. I thrice presented him with a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? Yet, Brutus says he was ambitious, and sure he is. An honorable man, I, I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? O oh, judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar, and I must pause till it come back to me. Of course, chaos is then unleashed on the world, and Antony and Octavian get revenge for the killing. Antony appears again, this time in a play that offers probably one of the most engaging and enigmatic women in all of Shakespeare, Cleopatra, about whom it is said, age cannot wither her nor custom stale her infinite variety. Other women coy the appetite they feed, but she makes hungry where most she satisfies. Quite a tribute, okay? Now her magnificence is described by Eno Barbus, <clears throat> Anthony's right-hand man. When asked about her, he says, I will tell you, the barge she sat in like a burnished throne burned on the water. The poop was beaten gold, purple, the sails and so perfumed that the winds were lovesick with them. The oars were silver, which to the tune of flutes kept stroke which made the water which they beat to follow faster as amorous of their strokes. For her own person, it beggared all description. She did lie in her pavilion, cloth of gold of tissue, or picturing that Venus where we see the fancy outwork nature. On each side her stood pretty, dimpled boys like smiling cupids with divers colored fans whose wind did seem to blow, the delicate cheeks which they did cool, and what they undid, did. Her gentlewomen, like the Nereides, so many mermaids, tended her in the eyes and made their bends adornings. At the helm, a seeming mermaid steers. From the barge, a strange, invisible perfume hits the senses of the adjacent wharfs. The city casts out her people out upon her. And Anthony, and throwing it in the marketplace, did sit alone, whistling to the air, which but for vacancy, had gone to gaze on Cleopatra too, and left a gap in nature. So well, there we have Shakespeare applying the laws of physics to poetry, right? Nature abhors a vacuum. If the air, the air couldn't leave Anthony, which it wanted to do, otherwise it would have created the vacuum. Anyway, to give you an idea of his level of cleverness. Uh, the play is dynamic, it's intense, it's highly emotional. In a lot of ways, it's like Romeo and Juliet. The lovers end up killing themselves. But it's much more adult. It's full of sensuality. It's full of sexuality. Uh, it's just so, so much more intense. And it's a play that's very much like a movie script. 
because there's so many scene changes. It's Shakespeare violating every classical rule of playwriting. Uh, he could do it. And then what about the play with probably one of the most extraordinary women in all of Shakespeare? The play, dare I say the name? Dare I say the name? Macbeth. <laughs> Lady Macbeth becomes devoted to the idea that her husband will be king. But as the act necessary to do that, the killing of Duncan nears, Macbeth expresses some reservations. And then Lady Macbeth goes after his manhood. What beast was then that made you break this enterprise to me? When you durst do it, then you were a man. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more the man. Nor time nor place did then adhere, and yet you would make both. They have made themselves, not their fitness now, to unmake you. And then she turns and says probably the most chilling lines ever uttered by a woman on stage. I have given suck and know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out, had I so sworn as you have done to this. How does Macbeth react on hearing that? How does the actor react to that when he hears that line? Good question for, for both. Macbeth then says, if we fail, and she replies, we fail, but screw your courage to the sticking place, and we'll not fail. When Duncan is asleep, whereto the rather shall his day's hard journey soundly invite him, will I with wine, his two chamberlains, will I with wine and muscle so convinced that memory, the water of the brain, shall be a fume, and the receipt of reason a limbeck only. When in swinish sleep, their drenched natures lie as in a death. What cannot you and I perform upon the unguarded Duncan? Okay, Macbeth then gets ready to go out and do the deed, when suddenly he is confronted by super, something supernatural. Is this the dagger which I see before me, the handle toward my hand? Come, let me clutch thee. I have thee not, and yet I see thee still. Art thou not fatal vision sensible to feeling as to sight? Or art thou but a dagger of the mind, a false creation proceeding from the heat oppressed brain? I see thee yet, in form as palpable as this which now I draw. Thou marshalest me the way that I was going, and such an instrument I was to use. Ah, oh, mine eyes are made the fools of the other senses, or else worth all the rest. I see thee still. I'm on thy blade and dudge and gouts of blood, which was not so before. There's no such thing. It is the bloody business which informs us to mine eyes. Now all the one half world, nature, seems dead in wicked dreams, abuse the curtain's sleep. Witchcraft celebrates pale Hecate's offerings, and withered murder alarmed by his sentinel, the wolf, whose howls his watch. Thus, with his stealthy pace, with Tarquin's ravishing stride towards his design, moves like a ghost. Thou sure and firm set earth, hear not my steps which way they walk, for fear thy very stones, pray to my whereabouts, and take the present horror from the time which now suits with it. While thy threat lives, words to the heat of deeds, too cold breath gives. I go, and it is done. The bell invites me. Hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. Well, he goes. <laughs> you ring my bell. <laughs> okay. Macbeth does the deed, comes back with bloody knives. And Lady Macbeth, of course, is outraged. She takes the knives, runs back to the murder site, and leaves them there. She returns and says to him, My hands of your, are, your, are of your color, but I shame to wear a heart so white. And then ominous, ominously she says, a little water clears us of this deed. <laughs> but then, later in the play, she's out about, out, damn spot. Out, I say, here's the smell of blood still. All the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hand. Oh, oh, oh. And then she dies shortly after that. And Macbeth offers this eulogy. 
she should have died hereafter, there would have been time for such a word. Tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. Can you imagine a world without Twelfth Night? Without As You Like It, without The Taming of the Shrew, without Julius Caesar, Antony, and Cleopatra? Macbeth, can you imagine a world without the first folio? Thank you, John Hemming. Thank you, Henry Condell. Now, the reception of the folio, copies, and the Mills College folio. Now, with the folio's 750 co copies, 235 still exist today. It probably sold quite well at the time, because within nine years, there was a second folio published. And then throughout the rest of the 17th century, two more folios were published. There is then a long history of first folios. Now, I've yet to discuss one play that had never before appeared in print. It was the first play listed in the catalog, and is probably the last play that Shakespeare wrote probably by himself. It's The Tempest. Now, The Tempest uh, has a female character in it. Here you can see, you skip something, dear. Ah, there it is. This is the only surviving original photograph of the original Miranda. Okay. I was very fortunate to come across that in an antique shop. <laughs> that was the surprise, honey. That's what you know. Okay, the play. She's a teenager in the play. I, I, I couldn't get a photograph of that. Uh, the play has one of Shakespeare's most interesting and curious characters, whose name is Caliban. He's a native of an island, and he's stripped of his sovereignty and independence by the invasion, if you will, of Prospero. So, one might ask, is he a reflection of the ambiguity uh, towards colonialism and its oppressive character? Caliban says in what is really a highly metaphoric speech, all the infections that the sun sucks up from bogs, fens, flats on prosper fall and make him by inch meal a disease. His spirits hear me, and yet I needs must curse, but they'll nor pinch, fright me with urchin shows, pitch me in the mire, nor lead me like a firebrand in the dark out of my way, unless he bid him, but for every trifle they set upon me, sometimes like apes that mow and chatter at me, and after bite me, then like hedgehogs, which like tumbling in my barefoot way, and mount their pricks at my footfall. Sometimes am I all wound with adders, who with cloven tongues do hiss me into madness. And this is a very typical lament, one might think, of people who have been displaced or enslaved, and it's very typical of the universality of Shakespeare. <clears throat> now, in the 19th century, collecting folios became a pastime. By the 20th century, they became collector's items, though they were not particularly rare. Henry Clay Folger, who was the chairman of Standard Oil, and his wife Emily began collecting first folios and a lot of other Shakespeare material which ultimately became the Folger Shakespeare Library, which is in Washington, D.C., which has this enormous wealth of material. They have 80 first folios, almost one quarter or one third of them. The next largest collection of first folios in a single place are 12 volumes in, of all places, Tokyo, Japan. Talk about the universality of Shakespeare. Now, of the, of the 235 folios known to exist, only 56 re retain their original nature. They're complete from beginning to end from their original printing. In mid-20th century, the selling price of the first folio was roughly $10,000. This is at auction. By 1985, the selling price was $590,000. In 2001, a first folio sold for $6 million. Wow. Then in 2020, a copy in the possession of our buddies down and over the hill there, Mills College, they had a pretty good first folio with a great provenance. The person who bought the first folio said, the first folio is the greatest work of the English language. <clears throat> Certainly the greatest work of theater. So it's something that anyone who loves intellectualism has to consider a divine object. Now, I don't have any disagreement with that. 
It sold for, are you ready for this? $10 million. Of this first folio, one reviewer said, all this for a book which has comparative, comparatively little scarcity value and which has a use value for most normal purposes inferior to almost any other extant collected edition of Shakespeare. Now that guy's a curmudgeon if you ask me. <laughs> okay, so The Tempest and Prospero are often seen by many as Shakespeare's farewell to the stage. And if you look at the speeches in the latter part of the play, you get a sense of that. So I will use one of Prospero's speeches to represent mine. Not only our look at The Tempest, but our look at that marvelous book that John Hemming, Henry Condell, William and Isaac Jaggard and Edward Blunt brought to the world. And as we celebrate the 400th anniversary of the publication of the first folio, William Shakespeare's first folio, the only first folio, we could heed Prospero's advice, if you will, to his about-to-be son-in-law. Be cheerful, sir. The revels now are ended. These are actors. As I foretold you, we're all spirits and are vanished into air into thin air, unlike the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit shall dissolve. And like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We, we, are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little lives are rounded with a sleep. And that's the story of the first folio beautifully corrected versions of plays that had already appeared in print, and giving us for the first time so many plays that are essential to the Shakespearean legend. <clears throat> I cannot imagine a world without them, and that makes this rather cumbersome, heavy, and not so rare a volume one of the most important books in history. I so hope you've enjoyed, enjoyed learning about the first folio. And I'd like to close my part of the evening with Prospero's lines, last two lines of this epilogue. As you from crimes would pardon be, let your indulgence set me free. And in the words of Hamlet, at his end, the rest is silence. <laughs> There's, there's a person who's got the same last name as me, but I've never met hers. Just, <laughs> <laughs> just for truth and honesty. <laughs> so, so do we have, Marissa, a couple minutes for a few questions? Anybody have any questions this evening? Lynn, go ahead. Yes, I'm so curious. The, the first thing that we talked about in the beginning, that were the first thing that we talked about in the beginning, that were not the original writings, um, that were Yes, they Uh, and, and let me why, let's repeat the question. Yeah, why, why, where did the bad portos come from, basically? And there's an, uh, the basic conjecture is that actors could make a couple of pennies if they brought a play to a publisher. They could make memorial reconstructions of the plays. And so some editors can look at the plays and say, oh, this Horatio, whose lines are specific here, was one of the pars pars one of the actors responsible for doing the bad Hamlet quarto. But there's a lot of speculation around it. No one really knows. I, it's been argued that those are early drafts of Shakespeare's work. And you know, I look at that and say, no way in hell, because Shakespeare couldn't have written that badly, uh, even in the first draft. <clears throat> Stan. Mark, marvelous, thank you. Uh, business question. Uh, why did uh, Blunt and the other minor partners in the syndicate have, uh, have ownership of specific plays? Uh, and then secondly, I think you indicated Henry and Connell didn't make much money from it. Why not? Well, the people who were, for the latter part, why <clears throat> didn't Henry and Connell make much money? They didn't expect it. It's the printers, publishers who would make money. Uh, they might have been given a fee for the plays. 
As far as the question of why uh, did other printers own the plays, because the acting company would sell plays to printers who wanted to print them, but then, you know, there's no copyright law then. Uh, possession is 20 tenths of the law back in those days, and so the printers would have the rights or own the rights to the plays, and you had to go to the master of the revels and the stationer's company to get permission to print, and they could stop, if somebody else owned the rights to the play, they could stop the printing of the play. I'm curious how Mills College came into possession of such a valuable portfolio. That is the question. <laughs> uh, it was given to them. I'm not sure exactly when it was given to them. It had an incredible good provenance. The provenance took you back to the early 18th century, and it was owned by somebody really important who I don't know, and it was absolutely perfect copy with annotations and scribblings and written in it. So, you know, they sold, they were trying to raise money to save themselves. Well, they raised the money. <laughs> Any other questions? Go ahead. Oh, you started with your, your very first slide, the women in Shakespeare's life, and somehow you didn't hear anything about it. Is it too late to say something? You didn't. Well, that's because you weren't listening. <laughs> oh, no, it was just the, oh, it was just, all the actors who appeared one way or another in Shakespeare's plays. You should, you could, if you saw the slide long enough, you probably would have recognized them. But it was Lady Macbeth and Isabella, and oh, they were hoping what? Well, I gave as many anecdotes as I can using some of the plays. Some people listen and some people don't. What can I tell you? She's a friend of mine. I hope you know that's. She, she may throw things at me later, but any more? Okay, well, thank you so much for coming.